the search for the greatest twin fin on the market continues today with four new shapes from some of the world's best. Surfboard sales are at their highest point in history, but some balk at the idea of spending close to or even over a thousand bucks for a craft. But is this a valid point of view? Building a surfboard is an intense process and involves several different skill sets. First, a blank is purchased. That's your specific foam block. Then it is cut down with a $150,000 CNC machine operated by a human. It's cut to shape based on a file made by an experienced shaper, which is the result of countless hours of R&D. Next, the cut foam is finished. Fin boxes are then installed. Then it is glassed by a glasser using resin and other materials that have almost doubled in price over the past year or two. The leash plug is installed. It gets sanded and then sent to quality control, where it is often sent back to be tweaked again before it finally lands in your hands at the store. $1,000 for a surfboard might even be too cheap if we really want surfboard shapers to be sustained whilst building the very piece of equipment that brings us so much joy and purpose in life. All our brands in this series started off as local homegrown shapers and through a huge amount of work have grown their businesses, their brands, their reputations into something respected and known for creating incredible wave riding crafts. But I want to know who makes the best one. This is episode two of The Greatest Twin Fin. Good waves, good boards. This is what it's all about. This series is brought to you by my online surf school, The Surfer's Roadmap. It took me until my mid-20s to progress my surfing from intermediate to advanced, and I did it by learning it intellectually so I could coach. The curriculum we've developed at thesurfersroadmap.com, the same one that helped me improve, I think is the most effective out there and it's achieving incredible progression for thousands of students around the world, often in just one day. Be sure to check it out at the link in the description to support this and future productions. Let's rip in. There's a little swell coming. So Surfline is <laughs> predicting a bit of a cyclone swell to last until at least... Tuesday or Wednesday next week, and it's Tuesday today, so that means we should have a pretty good window. Oh, even some little orange there. Wax up your crafts, everybody. Oh, wow, I reckon it's going to be better from Sunday to Tuesday. Really? Just an easy board. It felt actually quite albumy, um, and just felt smooth, smooth. There were a couple little catchy moments, which is normal as if I'm like trying a, a new board. Um, but yeah, that felt felt really nice. It's a good board. It's different this year. I mean, obviously being outside of the wave pool, way less control, way less standardization. But I still think that there's strength in doing the test in the ocean because you know you're getting that raw power that typically we don't see in the wave pool so which may, which may have limited boards last year it was actually really hard to convince a lot of shapers to become involved in the test ultimately when we can't promise a positive review uh, it does become a little bit um, more difficult especially after last time there was a bit of whiplash I guess that you know that's my allegiance is to you guys uh, in providing an honest review not to the board manufacturers even though I really appreciate them being involved in giving me uh, these crafts to test
Oh my god, I'm so glad we're just getting waves. It's fantastic. The Christensen is just like a like a sick it's like a cutback board. It just felt like it wanted to be put on rail the whole time and it really came alive. To be honest, I didn't think I'd like that with the weird tail and stuff. The Sharp Eye, I was just saying, is one of the most technical, weirdest boards that I've ever ridden, I think. But it's electric. Like you put it on rail and it just flies. It's so fast. There's just a couple of weird moments on it that I'm still figuring out. So I'm gonna jump on the light bender, smaller than I'd normally ride. Five foot four, 19 and five eighths, two and seven sixteenths. Yeah, small board, but I know it can do well because I've ridden it before, but we'll see how it stands against all these incredible boards. Good waves, good boards. This is what it's all about. Yes, I think more volume if you're riding a shorter, stubbier style twin fin. Obviously you wanted to ride these boards a little shorter. So as you drop down, you definitely need to increase, you know, width and thickness. And obviously, you know, if, if you're aiming to ride medium to small wave, it's always good to have a notch up on, on the volume. You know, I, I like a little more volume on the smaller surf, you know, especially the paddling and all that. Uh, but once you stand on it, yeah, you wish you had less volume. You know, it's always that catch, you know. If it's a cuppy, like, juicy wave, you can do with less volume because then you can, you can use the power of the wave to make it give you all that speed and all that. But when the wave doesn't quite have that, like, cup and, and power, yeah, I would prefer a twin fin that has more volume. Sometimes with a lot of volume in a PU board, they're a bit delayed in how they react because, you know, you've, there's, there's, a, there's a, just a lot more uh, weight there. Where the EPS, you can still have the same amount of volume and they just feel a bit more sensitive and a bit more high performance. This board, it just feels like something I could get even more used to. A few little moments where I can't quite get the rail in, but uh, a lot of moments where I can, and it just feels really trustworthy, reliable, and easy. So yeah, I dare say this one's gonna go through the final, I reckon. I think I've given this board as much of a crack as I can. It's just too unforgiving. Uh, it really has only been come good on like the steepest, biggest wave of the session. So that just means for me, it's too niche. Um, I think this is probably gonna be reserved for great waves. If you're surfing great waves all the time, or you want a great wave twin, then I think this board would be good. It's the most personal.
just was so forgiving and let me sort of rip into it and maintain control, stability. There was really not even a moment where I lost any sort of confidence in what the board was going to do. Um, it just felt amazing. The only downside of this board is that it's a little, it's a little bit hard to paddle being a 5'4". Uh, but that's also, I'm surfing four hour sessions, so I may just be exhausted and my arms are going, get on a mid-leg or something. It's just a really classic, high performance twin tip. Look at the tails of both of these boards. I mean, you can see the width is really maintained in the axod all the way through. So you look at the center of the board all the way through the tail, there's not a huge sort of pull in, whereas the light bender here really pulls in. And I think it's that pinny sort of element to the board that helps it pivot a little easier. With the Axod, the moment you put this on rail, the two fangs, it just goes really fast. And that can be great. It's rarely a criticism for a board to go fast, but when I put this on rail, because it's going so fast, it means your arcs have to be really drawn out. And that can be challenging on a wave where you're trying to surf tight, where you're trying to fit in multiple maneuvers. I felt like this board wanted to do downturns. It didn't want to do cutbacks. Utilising a clever tail design in a surfboard can make or break a shape. There are numerous ways to skin a cat. Here's what some of our experts think. Uh, the swallow is kind of like two teeth and water wraps around and it grips and you have that long rail line all the way to the tail. So your foot is generally a lot further forward because there's, there's a good three inches of board cut out that you can't necessarily stand on. And with your foot further forward over fins or in front of fins, it, it creates a drivier trailing fin behind your foot, so it surfs with a, a lot more, like a stiffer feeling. And then, say, at the rounded pin on a 20, because you're coming into a nice small pin tail, you're eliminating surface area that's adding control and sensitivity, that is going to feel more reactive. You know, like, what feels best, you know? Of course, if I, want to increase the drive, I'm going to pull in a little bit of the tail and then I might have the fins a little more straighter, you know, and up. So that way I have more direction and it holds high speed. I've ridden them from squares to pins to swallows and they've all worked in the right type of shape. I do love a sexy swallow tail though. That's, I mean, the thing about the aesthetics of a swallow that's sick. When you've got three fins, your outline and your tail is completely different and your rail rock is completely different than two fins. The whole board changes. You've got to have a certain amount of width in the tail and, and straightness in the outline to have hold the area in the tail. Uh, you've got to have a certain amount of concave in there and a certain amount of concave V to, to hold, to stick onto the wave and then your fins. So it's all got to work together. If, that, if the two fangs pulled in, They'd be the, almost the exact same board. And the performance is, is vastly different. It's amazing to me how minute changes in shape, in outline, in curvature have such a big impact out in the water. On the next episode of The Greatest Twin Fin, we're deciding our four finalists. But with three great new boards added into the mix and more cyclone swell on the way, it's going to be an extremely hard decision.
We'll also explore backhand surfing on a twin. Why is it harder than a traditional board? We'll see you there. And until then, be sure to sign up to thesurfersroadmap.com, the go-to resource for all your surf progression, no matter what ability level you are now. Check it out at the link in the description below.